When I first started school teaching in Australia in 1975 as a public school teacher teaching science, I know that I took my students to museums. I like to take them on excursions, would take them out to mud flats and all sorts of different places. I had already seen that the students were looking at Christianity as, well, not valid because of what was taught in their textbooks about evolution. I was challenging them concerning that. And as I took them to these museums, I was really burdened that, why can't we have a creation museum? Every museum we go to, it's always from an evolutionary perspective. So when we began the Ministry of Answers and Genesis, really the aim in mind was to build a creation museum. The first memory of the creation museum is we're talking about Buddy Davis and a couple of his dinosaurs. And uh, we were looking at a little 5,000 square foot building. We put a guy on researching the area to find a good location that was zoned right, that had the infrastructure where we could build something. And so that's when we found this uh, place here. I'll never forget some of the first meetings we had. A little house here on the property called Deck Lane House. And that was our board meeting room. And there's big hole in the ground. So we'd wear these big muckluck boots and uh, put some hard hats on and walk through the mud uh, just to dream. When we were announcing that we we're going to build a creation museum, it uh, got into the newspapers and a man called Patrick Marsh sent us an email and said, I heard you're building a creation museum. I've worked for Universal Studios, I've worked in theme parks around the world, worked for the Olympic Games. Can I come and design your creation museum? And then I handed Patrick the script for the creation museum, the seven seas of history, the walk through the Bible, and he took that and he turned it into the three-dimensional exhibits that we have here, which are world-class exhibits. And of course, people are just astonished at the quality of the Creation Museum. So when the media say to me, so is this what you envisaged it to be? My answer is, well, no, <laughs> I didn't think it'd be this good. I had no idea. You know, it's one thing to have a vision for something and know the message you want to be able to get to people, but how do you put that into something like a, a, a museum like this? Well, God brings the right people along and he's brought the right people along at the right time. We got into the museum, got into the building in, in September of 04, and we started building the actual Creation Museum exhibits. And we'd show people through there and we were doing behind the scenes tours all the time. And when we got to the Noah's Ark por portion of the, the exhibits, you know, it just, it amazed people. And we realized, I really realized that people are really interested in the Ark. Of all of the different, the seven seas that we go through, there's a fascination about the Ark and you know, how they could have pulled that off. This Ark is huge. The Lord brought to me two of every kind of ladder. Very good question. Anything else? I know for me, I've heard many people over the years make a statement like, you know, you guys should build the ark. I've heard that sort of thing over the years. I heard it even in my days in Australia. Wouldn't it be great to build the ark? And in 2004, we actually had a brainstorming session here in these offices. And it's interesting because we produced this document for the board and it's likely recommended directions for the ministry. And this is after brainstorming with the leadership. And number seven is actually build the ark. You can see it right there. Number seven, build the ark. This is the first real recorded evidence of the vision for the ark project. And that was October 6, 2004. And that was the document that was gonna be presented to the board. And that was a lead up to a strategic plan. And this is the strategic plan. You can see the size of this uh, plan here. Uh, this is a lead up to the strategic plan that was to be uh, presented the next year. In fact, 
uh, on the front of this, it says May 26, 2005. You know, it's interesting just to read what, what was written here. Uh, for instance, building a full-size ark, possibly the greatest of all the opportunities before Answers in Genesis is clearly top priority. Uh, goes on, why build the ark? Answers in Genesis is uniquely qualified to undertake this project given its background and reputation in regard to the book of Genesis. The stage is truly set. Answers in Genesis will have already established itself as a destination through the Creation Museum. Millions will have already had an exciting experience with ARG and these experiences will mature into ongoing relationships. And so it's interesting to read through uh, all the information that we see there and to know that back then in 2005, we actually laid out the strategy for building the ark, but the actual first recorded evidence of the vision for the ark goes back to 2004. Well, the Creation Museum was designed to equip Christians to be able to defend their faith right from Genesis, which is the most attacked book of the Bible. But we also wanted to evangelize people who would come here out of curiosity. Now, the Ark gives us an opportunity to be even more evangelistic because it was a vessel of salvation for Noah and his family. And so with an Ark here in Northern Kentucky, gives us not only the opportunity to answer the most asked questions people have, including Christians, about the flood and the ark, this can be even more evangelistic because we can present Christ as our modern day ark of salvation using this ark of Noah as a springboard to do that. I think the other thing that the Creation Museum's done, even though we would have never seen it this way at the time, is it really sort of worked as a warm up for the, for the bigger thing. And I'm not sure that the Ark is the bigger thing in certain aspects, but it's definitely the bigger thing in terms of audience draw. And so the fact that, that every day, day in, day out, the Creation Museum pulls off this world-class experience unlike anything on the planet has allowed a group of, uh, of really the most incredible people I've ever met to prepare to do the same thing for five times as many people a year, and maybe 10 times. I remember talking about, well, maybe we could build it on the other side of the lake here. But that's when we did a study with America's research group and had them go out and find out if we built the ark, how many people would come. And when they came back and had estimates like 1.2 million up to 2.1 million, we gulped and realized, wait a minute, this can't even be on this property. We really looked at whether we could build an ark uh, you know, exhibit around here close to the Creation Museum. But the more we looked at it, we realized that it was just going to be impossible that the property here was not big enough, you know, where we are at the Creation Museum. And we looked all around here and couldn't find anything that was an appropriate size or what have you. So we started looking all over the tri-state and uh, quite, a, quite a few different places. We'd get up in airplanes and we'd fly around and we'd see if there were spots that sort of seemed like a possibility to be able to do it. And eventually the opportunity opened up in Williamstown, Kentucky, which is where we ended up getting the project. And we were able to buy the property there between two, uh, two different landowners, which is really amazing, 800 acres out there to do it. The consultant we were talking to, Kerry Summers, about how to put this attraction and theme park together and all the thought, the considerations. And he was working with a gentleman named Leroy Troyer up in Mishawaka, Indiana, who had owned the Troyer Group, which was an architectural design and build firm. And he called me and said, uh, say, I received a call from Answers in Genesis, and they have this idea of possibly uh, uh, building an ark said, okay, so we, uh, uh, so Perry Summers and I went to uh, meet with uh, Ken Ham and Mike Zoboth and, and Patrick Marsh. And they shared the idea and, and discussed the concept of how do you really build an ark? Uh, we, uh, we'd like to build a wood, but we, we don't know whether we can do really do wood. And we had just uh, completed a large, uh, probably the largest wooden peg barn in the country. So I invited them to come up and see that. We went up to visit them 
and they arrange for us to meet uh, the, the heads of uh, the crew that did the timber framing and they were from the Amish community. So we were going to meet the three Amish men who actually supervised the crews that actually built this timber frame building. The ark, I, I told them, was meant as a tool to equip families concerning the truth of God's Word but to challenge people concerning the truth of the Gospel. And at the end, and I watched these three men were sitting there and one of them stood up and, and he looked at me and, you know, he said, maybe God has been preparing us all these years just for this. Because these people are experts in being able to put up wooden structures, experts in knowing how to work with wood. And the fact that he said that, uh, we took that as, wow, God's opening this door. We sat down with Leroy and his team for months and months, going back and forth over the drawings. And then and we did this as funding came in because we didn't have a lot of funds for, for the Ark at the time. We were just wrapping up the museum. So as we had money, we would spend our time with Leroy and his group, his design firm, and they would spend their time and our money designing the, this Ark. And then we, we got some serious funding and we were able to to pull the trigger on this thing and go full, full steam ahead. Get your pegs ready. Okay, and I'm gonna to count to three. Okay, are we ready? On the count of one, two, three. <laughs> this is an historic moment. Here I am sitting in the very first Earth Mover that was delivered to the property where the life-size Noah's Ark is going to be built and opened in 2016. I know for a lot of people, this has been a long time coming. Some people think it's taken millions of years, but you know, many people don't even understand what it takes to construct a massive project like this. As a lot of prep work has gone on behind the scenes, we built an access road, had to take down some trees. We've been waiting on permits, had to put in erosion control. Also, a lot of surveying had to be done, the architectural diagrams, the engineering, and permits take a long time. One permit has taken well over a year, but now all the permits are in hand, the heavy equipment has been delivered to the site, excavation is going to start, construction will begin very, very soon, and the wood will go up on the ark in 2015 and will be open in 2016. So we praise the Lord uh, that we're at this particular moment in the history of the life-size Noah's Ark project. And so we stepped out to build a life-size ark. Actually, it is so much more complicated than I ever thought it was. We thought the museum was much more complicated and involved than we thought it would be. This is exponentially more complicated. Just like everything in Kentucky, it's hill and valley, hill and valley. So needless to say, where we figured out we could put the ark, we had to, that, that was kind of a, a curved hill at that spot right there. And so we figured that we'd have to take about 30 feet off of the top of it to flatten out and fill in the valleys and try to create enough flat land for people to really have, you know, a park there. So that's what we did. How do you build something where we want it to be a wooden ship? but we want it to be built as a building, as a tourist attraction. We want to keep all the restrooms and stairs out of the building itself because we want it to really be a ship inside and we want to fill it with exhibits and we want it to be off the ground so people can walk under it and you've got to fit with all the codes of today, which are probably very different than the codes of Noah's day. How do you do all that? And they came up with this ingenious design of three towers that the Ark would anchor to built on this giant platform, which you won't see the concrete platform once the ark is built because the wood goes over it and under it, uh, 15 foot off the ground, uh, actually because these piers are 15 feet high, and the ark anchors to these three buildings. The buildings extend a little bit into the ark so that they can anchor it and so that people have access to those buildings where there's stairs, elevators, restrooms, and the infrastructure that's needed for, for the entire structure. The design on the Ark um, is very complex and it's very unique. We remodel uh, 
older buildings from the 1800s in downtown Grand Rapids that are all wood structure. And today, uh, everything is built out of steel or concrete or precast or cast in place concrete. And in this day and age, buildings just aren't constructed entirely out of wood like the Ark is. So it's, it's really a unique experience and it's, it's um, kind of a dream come true for me to be able to work on that type of a project. I have a feeling people are gonna just sort of stand in awe and just kind of look around at the structure because the whole ship is made out of wood and you're talking about wooden beams that are 22 to you know, 24 inch square pieces of lumber. I mean, I mean tree trunks and, and the whole center are basically these, these incredible um, spruce tree trunks that go up 65 feet up in the air. I mean, it's just an amazing, amazing ship. An average house has about 15,000 board feet of timber. If you were doing a full timber frame house with the post and beam structure and the heavy timber, an average, let's say 3,000 square foot house. In this particular project, there's 1.5 million board feet of heavy timber. So it's an exponential amount of timber versus a regular house. Every one of these logs has to be cut by hand and it takes about six guys, two days to cut one log. So it's an incredible amount of work. When you're dealing with a large scale like this, the complexity of the connections of how the timbers connect into one another is mind boggling. They were dead standing Engelman spruce logs that were actually harvested out of the forest in Utah. We make sure that they're certified through the forestry service they were responsibly harvested because they were already dead trees that were just taken out of the forest before they rotted. And now they're being repurposed and put into a structure like the Ark so that everybody who comes through it can enjoy the character and the size and the magnitude of these logs. This is gonna be the largest freestanding timber frame structure in the entire world. It's an engineering feat at a minimum. When they set the first beam last summer at the Ark, that we had to start building from the center out. And you've got the construction crews that are responsible to build the timber framing. They build out to a certain point. And then you bring all these different trades in, the, the electrical trade and the, the air conditioning trade and the fire suppression and plumbing. In the ark itself, we're gonna be continuing on with the work with the timber. There's a lot of work being done by the electrician. They're doing the, the heavy electrical installations, getting the, the switch gear and the, the heavy wires pulled, putting in the three and four inch conduits all the way up through the electrical chase to the top floor. We're gonna be installing the concrete planks on the roofs. The plumbers have got the bathroom units completed on the first deck and on the second deck and they're working on the third and fourth decks right now. We have carpenters inside with metal studs studying up the bathrooms. The masons, they'll be up to 60 feet. By the end of third week of October, we should be able to put the roof deck on that west tower, the bow tower. It's a challenge to get everybody to do what they need to do so the next step can be done, but we're, we're having good success with it. Usually in a building, you've got the building built and then the trades come in and get their thing done and then they leave. Well, with this process, we got a center quarter of the building built and then all the trades came in and the builders keep building it out left and right, heading toward the bow and the stern and the trades never leave. They're in there the entire time. Add into that our team coming in to start building exhibits and we've got our own construction crews our own electricians, our own pneumatics, our own special effects that are going in on top of all these people that are still in there going back and forth from bow to stern. It, it's just, it's really complicated. The most incredible thing to me and the greatest thing that I have learned is that you never can do anything in your own strength. When I came to work on the Creation Museum, it was impossible for me to be able to hire the same kind of people and the same kind of um, fabricators that I would have for Universal Studios. And little by little, God brought me talented, talented people that I really thought that would be absolutely impossible to find here in Kentucky, in, in this rural place. And, and yet God has 
been so gracious and constantly brought people to the design team. I am nothing without what he has done. And all I can do is just have an imagination, but if there's nobody to produce it and uh, bring it about, then it can't happen. But God has really been incredible. I'm often asked the question, how did you obtain all these people, these qualified people, these talented people, these sculptors and artists and designers and all the people associated with Answers in Genesis? Well, I tell people, it's like Noah in the flood. Noah didn't have to go out and look for the animals. God brought the animals to him. And it's the same for us. God has brought all these people to us. It's amazing the testimonies you'll hear from people and how God brought them to us. He brought them to this ministry. Now, Ken and I talk about God bringing the animals to Noah and bringing all the talent to the ministry. We, we have no idea where to look for most of the people that have come in. And the talent is just incredible. And you just kind of scratch your head and say, praise the Lord, thank you for bringing this person in or these people in. And we've got people on staff that have skills we didn't, didn't even know they had when they, we hired them. And we find out six months later, we need somebody that can do this and oh, by the way, this guy can do that. It's just a, an amazing, blessed process that, that we're going through. One of the great blessings of the Ark Encounter is that many of the same talented, creative people who built the Creation Museum are on board now for the Ark. Many evolutionists who have been to the Creation Museum will admit it's the best looking, most high tech museum they've ever seen in the world. And to have the same talented people involved in the Creation Museum project, to have them there with the Ark, People are going to have a world-class experience at the Ark Encounter. You know, my, my dad is involved in the construction and real estate business. And so as I grew up, uh, there was a period of time I thought I would be going on to seminary. And, uh, and then based on um, just some time transpiring and working in different things, um, I got involved in, in, um, in construction. And um, it's interesting to look back now and see all the different things that I had learned um, in terms of construction and the experiences that led up to um, being able to, to help uh, with the ARC project. What's interesting and what's kind of a dream come true for me is to be able to take those skills and gifts and apply those and help help with the uh, ARC project. So there's a number of things that uh, go into looking at the ARC project from the design all the way through the construction. And um, it's neat to see how God prepared me um, you know, way in the past, all the way up until the time that the ark was being planned and I could help out with that. You know, people don't realize, I mean, they come to the Creation Museum and they walk around and say, wow, this is great, this is fantastic. But, you know, when, when you're involved in pioneering something and you're a part of it, you, you get to experience all the issues that go on and there are massive problems associated with it all. How do you design this? And how do you fit this in there? And how do you do this? And well, for the ark, fortunately, uh, we have the directions God gave in the Bible. So we know it's got to be a certain length, a certain width, a certain height. It was designed as a ship and then built as a building. We, we first were really looking at just doing the ark itself. And as we got into it, we found out how popular it was going to be. Um, then we suddenly realized, or I suddenly realized, it's like there is no way that we can contain all of these people. We have to have more attractions for them to be able to spread out and do more things because the ark itself would never handle all the people that want to come. So as a result, I started laying out a larger plan, starting with uh, really what, what would be the kind of entrance into the park itself, which uh, is the walled city. Now here's another exciting part of the project. Rebuilding Noah's Ark, that's only phase one. We have other phases planned as well. We've master planned an entire park to go with Noah's Ark. We have, for instance, a petting zoo, a stage for live animal programs, a children's area, a Tower of Babel with a 5D theater, a ride through the plagues of Egypt, the first century village, drama theaters, a pre-flood village, amphitheater, all to help people have an encounter with God's Word and so have an encounter with the message of salvation. Well, good morning. Well, I know uh, you're here because we're going to announce the opening date of the Ark Encounter Project in 2016. 
For many people, they don't realize how big Noah's Ark really was. It was a massive wooden ship. Even where you're standing right now on the first deck, this is only the main part of the body of the Ark. The bow is yet to go on uh, behind you there, and the stern is yet to go on at the other end. Well, in 2016, 55 years after the publication of the Genesis Flood book, we're going to be opening the Ark Encounter, which is a reconstruction of Noah's Ark uh, based upon the dimensions as given in the Bible and recorded in the book of Genesis. In Genesis 7-7, it says that Noah and his family entered the Ark. There we are, the opening date of the Ark, Genesis 7-7, so on 7-7-2016, we will allow the public to enter the ark. When you get into the ark, I really wanted to give people a, a sense of kind of the, the, the whole uh, flood sequence coming on. As you get inside the door, all of a sudden, you know, lightning strikes and thunder and uh, you hear all of this booming and rattling and to kind of create an experience as you go inside the ark itself. And as you kind of come to a certain point, um, Noah and his family are up on this raised state and the whole family are around him praying and Noah's in the center and he's got an altar there. There's a little smoke sort of coming up and he's praying, kind of moving back and forth. And uh, that kind of sets the stage for the whole, um, the whole flood sequence coming on. I think it's going to catch people, really catch people off guard because they're coming to see what they think is, is a boat full of props and we're giving them some really good information and a lot of it's been censored from the secular world. They don't, people don't want to talk about it because it it's points to the accuracy and the, the authority of scripture and that's really what we want to show people. It's accurate, it's believable, it's authoritative and there's a, you know, there was a judgment in the past, there's a coming judgment and you need to be ready for that. You know, we're really not a creation evolution ministry primarily. That may sound strange to folks. We're really an authority of scripture. Can we believe this book? In progressive revelation, God starts in the beginning and gives us information and peace and introduces it and then builds on it all through the text of scripture. Wow, those, all of our doctrines in Genesis, all the key elements there, the need for the cross, original sin, etc., and Adam and Eve, a real Adam and Eve. So as I look at it that way and we view it as a ministry, we want to have people come to this conclusion that the Word of God is true, it's credible, it can be trusted all the way through the Bible. And uh, that really is, I think, the core of our heart, our heart value here is to think in terms of the authority of Scripture. But first and primarily, in my heart, I know in Ken's heart too, it's in all the board, the whole board, it's God's Word and a ministry first. This whole ark, this whole ark project is to open people's hearts to the truth of the Bible and all of the pieces that we're gonna be doing in it uh, really are to show them that these have been all real parts of history. Everything that we're gonna be showing them in the whole ark encounter uh, throughout the park is all real history and that Jesus came, and he really was a real person here. He lived and he died and he rose again and he's coming back. Now, ladies and gentlemen, will you join me in welcoming Pre Ken Ham, President, CEO, and founder of Answers in Genesis. <laughs> Well, thank you for all being here today. Uh, this really is an historic occasion. I believe it's an historic event in Christendom. The Bible tells us that Noah was to build an ark 300 cubits by 50 cubits by 30 cubits using a 20.4 inch cubit. That turns out to be 510 feet long, 85 feet wide, 51 feet high, one and a half times the length of a football field, half the width of a football field, People say, what are you really doing here? What statement are you making? Well, you know, in a world that we see becoming very secularized before our very eyes, 
it's really time for Christians to do something of this size, of this quality, that competes with the Disneys and the Universals to give a message to the world. We're presenting the message of God's word to the world. Hello, Louis Sequeira from Rapid TV News Agency in Germany. We heard it in the video, but what was the total investment here and where the investment investors come from? Okay, so the cost of this facility has been just over a hundred million dollars. And let me say this for all the media, not one cent has come from taxpayer money other than other than those taxpayers who have donated to this project. And so totally 100% privately funded. How important are those tax incentives for retiring that debt? And could you have done it without the incentive? Could we have built this without the tax incentive? Yep. Well, good morning. You are a beautiful sight this morning, 7,000 of you. I think the last of the buses just came through. There's one sight that equals this. You're looking at it. Life-size Noah's Ark. Well, a great time of celebration and rejoicing. And one of the, again, to use the word privilege, is to introduce Ken Ham, the visionary behind this project the uh, Creation Museum, and my very good friend of 35 years, Ken Ham. Well, thank you, Mark. So I want to start with a verse of scripture, Psalm 106, verse 1. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. We give all glory and honor to the God who created all things. El Elyon, God Most High. El Olam, the Everlasting God. Elohim Emet, the God of Truth. El Shaddai, God Almighty. El Hakavod, the God of Glory. El HaKadosh, the Holy God. El Tzaddik, the Righteous God. Elohim Chaim, the Living God. Adonai, my Lord. Emmanuel, God with us. Eyeh. I want to welcome everyone here. First of all, I'd like to especially welcome Lieutenant Governor Janine Hampton, representing Governor Matt Bevan, and the great Commonwealth of Kentucky. And so I welcome her to the stage. Wow, thank you. It is an honor to welcome you all to Kentucky. I understand there are people from all over the United States. Welcome to the great Commonwealth of Kentucky. And we are so blessed. I think God is here today, and even if it rains, that is okay. That is perfectly okay. So again, welcome, have fun, enjoy yourselves, and on behalf of Governor Matthew G. Bevan, we appreciate you. Welcome to Kentucky. Thank you. You know, quite a number of years ago, there was a man called Joshua, a great leader. He led the people of Israel across the Jordan River, normally fast flowing river. It was a miracle of God. And then God told them to take 12 stones and to build a memorial as a reminder so that the coming generations would not forget who God is and to also be a reminder to the world.
as we lay these 12 stones, we say, Lord, this is a reminder for the people of the world, for the coming great generations. Let them not forget the wondrous works that you have done, who you are and what you've done for each of us. There's our reminder to the world. Mayor Skinner from the city of Williamstown, thank you for all that you've done. Would you say a few words and officially cut the ribbon? Thank you. Thank you, Ken, for your leadership. On October 22nd, 2010, a group from Answers in Genesis came to a hotel in Northern Kentucky and invited the city of Williamstown, Grant County, and the Industrial Development Authority to announce a project. And that project was the Ark Encounter. We look forward to a great relationship with the Ark Encounter. At this time, I, on behalf of the city of Williamstown and the state of Kentucky, I would like to officially declare the Ark Encounter open. Building the Ark has been a monumental achievement, but because we had a successful museum and a growing donor base, we decided we could take on something more ambitious than even the Creation Museum, and God has blessed us to open this Ark and present to the world that the Word of God is accurate from Genesis to Revelation, including its accounts of Noah's flood and Noah's Ark, but most of all, it's accurate what it says about our need of salvation through Jesus Christ. You know, when the arts opened and people come and see that massive structure, and then all the exhibits inside the art, oh, that's a whole nother area. How all that comes together. The, the hours of discussions with all the artists and all that they have to put into it. It's amazing what goes on, and the talent. But when people come and see it, they'll just see that great big ship. Oh yeah, they will have no idea of the years of work. Years of, just in the fundraising aspects alone, some of the battles we had and the struggles we had and uh, the issues that came up and yet we see miracles. We see miracles from the Lord. I mean, real miracles. You know, w when you think about it, what a privilege. Really, I mean, what a privilege that we can be a part of this. You think about the fact that God is using this ministry to reach millions of people around the world. The Ark is going to be one of the greatest Christian outreaches of our era of history, and we have the privilege of being a part of that. I, I, you have to just stand back and say, wow, Lord, the fact that you would allow me to be a part of this is just something that I, 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 I can't even explain. And I, I pray that this will be what we believe God has set it up to be one of the greatest Christian outreaches of this era of history. At a time when we see so much of the world becoming darker spiritually from a perspective of the Christian worldview collapsing, particularly in our Western world, what a time to shine a phenomenal light in this culture. <laughs>